So when Constantine had the Holy Sepulchre built. So that just gives you an idea of how big it is. So follow me down the street and we'll take you inside another structure which will help you understand the immensity of what was built here back in the early 4th century in the 300s. Follow me. You have to pass this building and keep going and then you'll find the entrance. But did you see that column? My goodness, it gives you an understanding of how big that church was. So let's go inside a lovely place called the Alexander Nevsky and we'll talk more about what the archaeology tells us about the history of this place and also speak a little bit more about prayer. So follow me. Too. So it is such a delight to be here in a little beautiful place which many people overlook here in Jerusalem and it's called the Alexander Nevsky Church. It's also a convent and we have the privilege of having the Mother Superior with us and this is, do we call you Mother Elizabeth? Yeah, our sister. Our sister. And this is also um, Natasha. I, for, I cannot actually pronounce your last name. I Natalia. Natalia. <laughs> and um, she is also uh, a resident here who is a Russian speaking uh, Christian, of course. And so she will serve as a translator. And so I'm excited to be able to learn more about this place and make sure that all of you, the next time you come here, can also visit this lovely place. Welcome inside this wonderful complex of Alexander Nevsky. It's not only a church that you can see here to my right, a beautiful sanctuary in the Russian Orthodox tradition because this is from um, the Moscow um, mission, I think is what they call it. But this is also a convent of a wonderful community of sisters that prays for us all the time. Anybody who comes here and asks them for prayer. And so they keep us 24 hours a day in their prayers and thoughts. But you can see here a staircase behind me and you can see an arch. This is clearly also archaeology. People come here because when this was purchased by the Oriental, I think it's kind of the Palestine Society, uh, they built this to make it a consulate or actually a place that would host uh, the Russian leaders. They never actually made it here because when they did the excavations, they found what's behind me. And this goes down to the same level of 2,000 years ago, most likely, some academics believe. Others say at least it's to the Arya Capitolina, which would have been 1,800 years ago with Hadrian. After the city of Jerusalem was destroyed, he rebuilt it as a pagan capital. So this archway, was it from Herod's time, meaning Jesus' time, or was it from that time, about 160, 70 years after? Well, they're not sure. Many of the stones were probably reused, but the level of the street tells us something wonderful about the church that Constantine and Helen built. Follow me and I'll show you what makes this so remarkable. You can see how high this archway is. I'm gonna come right through it and it looks like a door. It's fascinating and here to my left there's a column that's actually from the 11th century. But what I love is you can see here there's a corner. You have sort of a gate and a corner and the wall continues. And why is this important? Well, if you keep following me, you'll see something that they uncovered which is extraordinary. We are behind the chapel. 
that the Russian Orthodox have placed right here. But these stones, this is the level of that street. Behind me, you also see a wall. You see a man praying. And that is what most academics agree is the judgment gate, where Jesus would have left the city carrying his cross. And he would have gone up to this place, which was an abandoned quarry. And that is the place of Golgotha. In fact, what they've done at the top of these steps is they have a simple painting which shows the Lord carrying a cross, coming out of a gate. And you see right here, there's a pathway going up to a quarry. Golgotha is right there. And this gives us an understanding of where he would have walked when he came out of the city and made a turn up the path to be crucified. Now around that same stone and around, of course, the tomb where the Lord was buried and rose from the dead, Constantine and his mother Helen made a church. They built a church and that was in the 300s. Right on the other side of this wall is the ancient Cardo, main street of the Romans. Who made that street? Hadrian. And so if Constantine was gonna build a church, he told his engineers, we need to go up, up, up toward that quarry where the Lord was crucified. You see these steps? These would have been the steps going into the courtyard of that structure of Constantine and Helen. The step at the very top is the most ancient one. And so it gives us an understanding of the immensity of that church, but also what it looked like at the time of Jesus when he left the city and went up. Now you see behind me, this is actually a place of great prayer, because if you want to know where Jesus walked and you want to be where Jesus walked, that would be where it is. You also see to the right a small opening that would be right next to the main gate, and the gate, when it was closed at night, still had this opening, which Jesus actually refers to as the eye of a needle. It's harder for, excuse me, it's easier for a camel to pass through something like that than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. We have to be detached to, to uh, be able to enter and be united with the Lord. And so people can actually go in and out of that. It just gives another piece of archaeological proof that this was a gate to the city. And this part in front of us, where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is now, is outside those gates at the time of Christ. And so I think this is a perfect place to be able to finish our reflections on different forms of prayer as we see the sisters behind us before this judgment gate praying for each and every one of us. Right next to the rock that's straight from Calvary, standing in the threshold of what many academics believe to be the judgment gate where the Lord carried his cross out. Right next to the eye of the needle I left my pilgrim staff and the Bible. This speaks to us of so much desire that we have inside. These past few days, we've been discussing the different forms of prayer. We have a sister right next to us praying for each and every one of us. I wanted to take time in this place that's alive with prayer to discuss the last two forms of prayer that I think would help us in our own prayer life. The first is the word thanksgiving, a prayer of thanksgiving. If we think about the Greek meaning of that word, well, we know what it is in Greek. It's Eucharistia, rings a bell. It brings us back to our Sunday Eucharist. Everything that we do, the culmination, the source, and the summit of our liturgical life, of our life of Christians, is in the Mass. Not only is it bringing this reality here and now, the Lord's sacrifice, his self-giving to the Father, his resurrection, when we receive the Eucharist within us. This is something that just brings us straight into his heart and into his life. There couldn't be a better place for this. Thanksgiving characterizes the church's prayer for this very reason. In Thanksgiving, the Eucharist when it is celebrated, the church reveals what she is and becomes more of what she is. And that's the truth for each and every one of us. It really is the means and the work of salvation, the work of the Lord himself as he carried this cross, his action. It frees us from sin and death. It consecrates us anew to him. And it brings the church back to the Father 
this relationship that we've been talking about in prayer. That is the Thanksgiving. But there's also Thanksgiving, prayers of Thanksgiving. And so I just wanted to uh, talk about this a bit. We know that everything and in every moment can be a prayer of Thanksgiving. It's not always easy, but St. Paul actually challenges us uh, often in his letters. He begins with Thanksgiving, he ends with Thanksgiving, and I'll just read an example from 1 Thessalonians. He says, give thanks in all circumstances, all their circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He also writes to the Colossians in 4, chapter 4, verse 2, continue in steadfast prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. This should characterize our prayer. And when we think about Thanksgiving, at least I go to a really well-known song over these past years. It's still well-known and sung a lot, and it's um, Bless the Lord, O My Soul by Matt Redman. Now, the song is called 10,000 Reasons, of course. It's 10,000 reasons, it says, for my heart uh, to find. To find what? To find thanksgiving for the Lord. It's gratitude. In fact, it became very popular to have gratitude journals. There's one that I really think is neat. It's called the Giving Thanks Journal, and it's to share gratitude. Because when I'm grateful, I give thanks to the Lord. What is it that my heart is yearning to see? What can I bless the Lord for? This is a key part of prayer. It gives breath. It gives life. You know, when you're in darkness, when you find something to give thanks for, suddenly there's light. What am I thankful for right now? How often do I take time to say, Lord, thank you for... This means that our eyes are open, our hearts are sensitive. And that's why, we, as we've mentioned before, a Lumina or a journal um, where I can write down those things that I'm thankful for each day, those graces I've been given. It should be a part of Compline, my end prayer, the prayer before I go to bed. Many times, you know, if you take 10 minutes for an examination of conscience, sometimes it fills the whole moment. How wonderful to give thanks to the Lord himself. Now, sometimes if we're in a really difficult situation, um, that we can't get out of, we're trapped by sin, we're trapped by even more so external circumstances that we cannot control. You know, here in the Holy Land, we've often been, we've had the uh, people in Gaza very close to our prayers. We've had the people who, um, I often think of those children in Gaza who've been trapped in uh, being part of a terrorist organization from the time they were little. In my prayers, people who can't get out, people who are who are not just terrorists that are stuck, but um, hostages. These are horrible circumstances beyond our control. Thanksgiving, even there. In fact, the example that we were given when the sisters in Gaza sent us a video of the children receiving their first communion at the Feast of the Epiphany a couple months ago. How beautiful. Let us bring from the most difficult circumstance a moment of thanksgiving. This is a very important part of our prayer. And really, if we think about something less dramatic in our own lives, how can I bring light and thanksgiving to others' lives? Just give you an example. You know, the traffic here in um, the Holy Land is not easy. Jerusalem is difficult. There's a lot of places like that in the world, but there's nothing that changes a person's life than when you let the car in front of you go ahead of you. Suddenly, there it's like there's a big smile on their face. Or if somebody does something for you, do the dishes, set the table, um, pay for the groceries of the person behind you. This actually happened to me here. It's just like, oh my gosh, I, I don't deserve this. I want to give thanks. I want to give thanks. It changes our disposition. So giving thanks to the Lord for these things is definitely a wonderful form of prayer. But it actually elevates us even further to the last form of prayer that I want to discuss, and that's the prayer of praise, giving praise to the Lord. What is praise itself? It seems like, oh gosh, thank you, Lord, thank you. But mostly, praise has a very specific characteristic, and that is giving thanks to God, not for what he's done, although we thank him for that. Of course, he saved us. (laughs) He overcame death with his own death and resurrection. But it's actually recognizing God for who he is as God. What would be a really easy way of thinking about this? 
I think the perfect uh, image of that in the world is a mother. She will take her child in her arms. It doesn't matter if the child has done nothing, a newborn infant, they're only needy. She praises the Lord for that child. She loves that child more so for who they are, not because of what they've done, but just because they exist. That's what the prayer of praise really means. So one of the things I think we have to remember is that the Holy Spirit himself is the one who's working inside of us, bearing witness to the fact that we are children of God, helping us to understand who God is, not even understanding just with our minds, but with our hearts and with our, 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 um, our lives and the testimony of other people. So praise then encompasses and envelops it brings together all the forms of prayer that we've been talking about. And you know what it does? It raises them up to the Lord himself. That's why praise, it almost seems spontaneous, but it's like the end point of our prayer in a way. Like I said, it brings everything together, carrying this prayer toward the source and goal of all of us. St. Paul actually says it beautifully in 1 Corinthians. He says, one God, the Father from whom all things are, and to whom all things exist. This is where our prayer is. So I just wanted to point out some examples in a fantastic gospel writer, that's Luke. Not only wrote the Gospel of Luke, but also the Acts of the Apostles. And he seems to focus a lot on this prayer of thanksgiving. Let me just give you some examples. He expresses wonder and praise at Christ's marvels. And so he stresses that they are actions of the Holy Spirit himself which is the one who's in us, giving us, leading us to these, these uh, prayers of thanksgiving. In Acts chapter 2, verse 46, he actually says, The community devoted themselves to meeting together, breaking bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exaltation, exaltation uh, of heart, praising God. Acts 3 says also, When Peter healed the invalid, remember, over in the beautiful gate, this man, it says, leapt up walking, jumping, and praising God, an example that Luke points out in Acts number four. People were, quote, praising God for what had happened, and that's when Peter and John were questioned by the Sanhedrin. What an example. That was an impossible time, a difficult time. How about Acts 14? Paul's discourse um, to the Gentiles, what does, it, what does it say there? It says, quote, they glorified the word of the Lord. They were praising the Lord and glorifying him. So these are incredible examples of praise and thanksgiving in the life of the church, leading us forward. What else can we look at as an example? The Psalms. We talked about them as the, one of the most important prayers of the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, they gain that meaning, that messianic meaning. And so what is it that Paul is telling to the Ephesians? and to the Colossians, but especially in Ephesians, he says, address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord with all your heart. That is praise. Psalms were read and prayed in a new way, thanks to the Spirit in us, because they bring us to the mystery of Christ. And what's neat is that not just uh, the Old Testament psalms, but hymns, new songs, were um, composed by the church. I think he wasn't the first writer of hymns or promoter of hymns, St. Ambrose in Milan, but certainly the quality of hymns that came from there just made all of the Thanksgiving, the Eucharistic celebrations, the Masses, incredible. And so this was the first time that they became very common in use. Psalms, songs. Now, the other prayer that has, that ends actually with praise, is the doxology, the end of the Our Father, especially in the liturgical celebrations. It is simply a praise of God. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory. One of my favorite songs of the All Father, Our Father is the Matt Maher song, uh, his song of the Our Father, that he sings with Taya. And so the subtitle is, It's Yours. And there she is just praising the Lord because it's yours, it's yours. All praise, honor, and glory, yours is the kingdom. That's an example of praise. Now, the doxology um, isn't biblical, although most Christians pray it at the end of the Our Father. It actually comes from the Didache. That is the teaching of the Twelve Apostles. Didache means teaching. And so it was uh, a practice of the very first church of praise to the Lord. And it actually has its roots in Jewish liturgical prayer. 
So it makes a lot of sense. What are we doing? We're praising God for the marvels of his work through the history of salvation. Now there's one other thing I want to point to when we talk about the prayer of praise, and that is the book of Revelation. If you look there, it's filled with song. And this is when the songs are born straight to the lamb who's on the throne. Most theologians look at Revelation as the heavenly liturgy. It has things like, holy, holy, holy Lord, worthy are you, blessing, honor, wisdom, and thanksgiving be to our God. In fact, in Revelation, it sort of summarizes all of the prayer forms that we've been talking about and bring them together in praise. Even in martyrs, and this is the martyrs in Revelation chapter 6, it talks about them as witnesses through intercession. This is what they're doing. The prophets, the saints slain for the, uh, on earth for their virtues, this vast throng, it says in uh, Revelations 18 and 19. What do they do? They sing praise and glory to him who sits on the throne and of the Lamb. In our Eucharist and in our prayer, we're uniting ourselves to this song of praise in Revelation, the heavenly church. So the church on earth united to the church in heaven, united to the church, the church now, united to the church forever. And this is what is incredible. Faith is perfect praise, as St. James says, especially when it's in the midst of trial. And that's why if you look at Revelation, it's so extraordinary when it speaks about those who have come through trial and hardship with a strong faith. So the Eucharist, offered in the East, offered in the West, it expresses all of our forms of prayer, prayer of praise and prayer of thanksgiving. So from this place, I would like to challenge you again to say, okay, what do I want to give thanks to the Lord for? How can I praise Him? From this place, know that we're praying for you, the sisters are praying for you, and may God bless you, and I hope you can join us again tomorrow in our virtual pilgrimage of prayer.